Good day everyone, this is Jella and today we will be learning The Noble Ulysses by James Joyce and of course before we proceed to the story, let us learn who the author is. James Joyce Augustine or James Augustine Aloysius Joyce was born in February 2, 1882 in Dublin, Ireland into a Catholic middle-class family. He was an Irish novelist, poet, and a short story writer. He is known for his experimental use of language and exploration of new literary methods including interior monologue, use of complex network of symbolic parallels, and invented puns, words, and allusion in his novels, especially in Ulysses. So in 1923, his eyesight quickly diminished and he died in January 20 in January 13, I'm sorry, 1941 in Zurich, Switzerland. So he is one of the most innovative novelists of 20th century and one of the great masters of extreme consciousness in writing. So Joyce went to Jesuit school followed by University College in Dublin where he began publishing essays. After graduating in 1902, Joyce went to Paris with the intention of attending medical school. But soon afterward, however, he abandoned medical studies and devoted all of his time to writing poetry, stories, and theories of aesthetics. Joyce returned to Dublin the following year when his mother died. He stayed in Dublin for another year during which time he met he met his future wife, Nora Barnacle. Nora and Joyce left Dublin again in 1904, this time for good. So they spent most of the next 11 years living in Rome and Trieste, Italy, where he taught where he taught English, and he had and he and Nora had two children, Giorgio and Lucia. So he began writing Ulysses in 1914, and when the World War I broke out, he moved his family to Zurich, Switzerland, where he continued work on the novel. And in Zurich, Joyce's fortunes finally improved, and, and as, as his talent attracted several wealthy patrons, including Harriet Shell Lover. So this time, let's have a little background about the novel Ulysses. So Ulysses is named after Odysseus, the Latin name of the hero of the great epic poem or poem Odyssey attributed to the poet Homer. So Homer's epic tales of Odysseus' adventure following the Trojan War as he sails home to the land of Ithaca to rejoin his son Telemachus and his wife Penelope. So the three main characters of Ulysses are Stephen Daedalus, Leopold Bloom, and Molly Bloom. Parallel, uh, parallel the Odyssey Telemachus, uh, Odysseus and Penelope. So Ulysses was initially was initially published without chapter numbers or chapter titles. The 18 chapters called episodes still appear without titles in newer edition. So Joyce told his friends he named the episodes after the people, after people in events in Homer's Odyssey. Joyce first conceived of Ulysses as a short story to be included in Dumbliners, but decided instead to publish it as a long novel, situated as a short of sequel to a portrait of the artist as a young man. So Ulysses maintains Joyce's concern with a realism, but also introduces a stylistic innovations similar to those of his modernist contemporaries. So we are now down to the summary of Ulysses. So the Ulysses or the story begins at 8 a.m. just outside central Dublin in Mortallo Tower. So Stephen Daedalus is in mourning with his mother May, whose death more than a year before had brought him home from Paris. Stephen eats breakfast with his housemate Buck Mulligan and Buck's guest, an Englishman, Haynes. Stephen remaining aloof or remains aloof from his mocking friend Buck and Haynes. As Stephen leaves for work, Buck, or Buck orders him to leave the house key and meet them at the pub at 12.30. Stephen presents Buck. So around 10 a.m., Stephen teaches a history lesson to his class at Garrett Dizzy Boys School. After class, Stephen meet Mr. Uh, after class, Stephen meets Mr. Dizzy to receive his wages. The narrow-minded and prejudiced DC lectures Stephen on his life or on life. Stephen agrees to take DC's editorial letter about the cattle disease to acquaintances at the newspaper. Stephen then walks along the shore at Sandy Mount, philosophizing, urinating, and picking his nose. He thinks about his mother and feels guilty for not having prayed with her at her deathbed. So the narrative turns back to 8 a.m. that same day, bit in a different household. 
Leopold's Bloom, who sells arts for a living, is making tea for his wife Molly, a housewife and a talented singer who grew up in the island of Gibraltar. Gibraltar. I'm sorry, I cannot really pronounce the L and T. Gibraltar, which was a British outpost. Leopold brings Molly tea and cooks for his own breakfast. He brings in the mail and notices a letter that he is suspected for Molly's lover, Blaze Boyland. After breakfast, Bloom goes to the outhouse where he reads a melodramatic story and then tears up a page and then uses as his toilet paper. Bloom then leaves the house and stops by a post office where he picks up a flirtatious letter from a secret correspondent, Martha. Bloom takes a bath at the bathhouse and then attends a funeral of Paddy Tegnum, an acquaintance. Around 11 a.m., he rides to the cemetery with Simon Daedalus, Stephen Swather, Martin Cunningham, and Jack Power to the funeral of Paddy Tegnum. The men treat Bloom as somewhat of an outsider. At the funeral, Bloom thinks about the death of his son and his father. Bloom was not close to Dignum, but he spent time thinking about death. He recalls his own father, Rodolph, who committed suicide, and his son, Rudy, who died in infancy. At noon, Bloom tries to sell an ad at the newspaper offices. Several ideal men, including editor Miles Crawford, are hanging around in the office discussing political speeches. Bloom leaves to secure the odd. Stefan arrives at the newspaper with DC's letter, and Stefan and the other men leave for the pub just as Bloom is returning. Bloom's, uh, uh, Bloom's odd negotiation or negotiation is rejected by Crawford, uh, the editor, on his way out. Stefan is well liked by the newspaper men, but Bloom's not, or Bloom is not. So Bloom leaves unsuccessful in placing his ad. So at 2 p.m., Stefan is informally presenting his Hamlet theory in the National Library to the poet A.E. and the librarians John Ellington, Best, and Lister. A.E. is dismissive of Stefan's theory and leaves. Bach enters and jokingly scolds Stefan for failing to meet him and Haynes at the pub. On the way out, Bach and Stefan pass Bloom, who has come to obtain a copy of K's at so at 5 p.m., Bloom arrives at Barney Kiernan's, or Kiernan's pub to meet Martin Cunningham about the Degnam family uh, finances. But Cunningham has not yet arrived. So there was a citizen, a grand or belligerent Irish nationalist, become increasingly drunk and begins attacking Bloom, uh, Bloom's Jewishness. Bloom stands up to the citizen speaking in favor of peace and love over xenophobic violence. Bloom and the citizen had an altercation on the street before Cunningham's garage carries Bloom's away. So Bloom relaxes on Sunday Mount Strand around sunset after his visit to Mrs. Dignam's house nearby. A young woman, Gertley McDowell, notices Bloom watching her from across the beach. Um, Gertley reveals more and more of her legs while Bloom is masturbating in front of her. Uh, Gertley leaves and Bloom dozes. So at 10 p.m., Bloom wanders to the maternity hospital to check on Mina Purify. Also at the hospital are Stefan and several of medical student friends drinking and talking boisterously about subject related to birth. Bloom agrees to join them, though he privately disapproves of their rivalry in light of Mrs. Purifoy's struggle upstairs. Buck arrives and the men proceed to Burke's pub. At closing time, Stefan convinces his friend Lynch to go to the brothel section of the town to find a prostitute and Bloom follows feeling protected. So Bloom finally locates Stefan and Lynch at the Bella Cohen's hotel. Stefan is drunk and imagines that he sees the ghost of his mother, full of rage, and he shatters along with his walking stick. Bloom runs after Stefan and finds him with an argument with a British soldier who knocks him out. So Bloom revives Stefan and takes him for a coffee at the Kaufman's shelter to sober up. Bloom invites Stefan back to his house. Well, after midnight, Stefan and Bloom arrive back to uh, arrive back at Bloom's house. They drink cocoa and talk about their respective backgrounds. Bloom asks Stefan to stay the night, but Stefan politely refuses. 
Bloom sees him out and comes back in to find several evidence of Boylan's visit. Still, Bloom is at peace with the world as he climbs into bed and tells Molly of his day and requests for breakfast in bed. After Bloom falls asleep, Molly remains awake, surprised by Bloom's request for breakfast in bed. So, after Bloom falls asleep, Molly remains awake, surprised by Bloom's request for breakfast in bed. Her mind wanders to her childhood in Gibraltar. Her afternoon of sex with Boyland, her singing career, Stephen Dedalus. Her thoughts of Bloom vary wildly over the course of the monologue, but it ends with a reminiscence of their intimate moment of at hold and a positive affirmation. Molly narrates the final episode reflecting a love, marriage, and her life with Bloom. So a short summary like this can capture all the simultaneous dances and details of the epic novel. So we are now down to the themes of the novel Ulysses. So the first theme that we have here is the quest for paternity. Uh, at its basic level, or at its most basic level, Ulysses is a book about Stephen's search for a symbolic father and Bloom's search for a son. So if you can still remember, I have mentioned in the story that Rhodes, or Bloom's son Rhodey, died in infancy. So in this respect, the plot of Ulysses parallels Telemachus' search for Odysseus, vice versa in the Odyssey. Bloom's search for a son stems, at least in part, from his head to reinforce his identity and heritage through progeny. Stephen already has a biological father, Simon Daedalus, but considers him a father only in flesh. Stephen feels that his own ability to mature and become a father himself is restricted by Simon's criticism and lack of understanding. Thus, Stephen's research involves finding a symbolic father who will turn allow Stephen himself to be a father. Both men in truth are searching for paternity as a way to reinforce or to reinforce their own identities. The second theme that we have here is the remorse of conscience. So the phrase action bite of inheat, a religious term meaning remorse of conscience, comes to Stephen's mind again and again in Ulysses. Stephen associates the praise or the phrase with his guilt over his mother's death. He suspects that he may have killed her mother by re refusing to kneel and pray at her sick bed when she asked. So the theme of remorse runs through Ulysses to address the feelings associated with modern breaks with family and tradition. Bloom, too, has guilty feelings about his father because he no longer observes certain traditions his father observed, such as keeping kosher. Uh, in episode 15, Cersei dramatizes this remorse as Bloom's scenes of the past arise up and confront him one by one. Ulysses juxtaposes characters who experience remorse with characters who do not such as Mulligan or Buck Mulligan. Who shamelessly refers to Stephen's mother as beastly dead. So that's uh, one of the reasons why Stephen doesn't like Locke and Simon Daedalus at Daedalus, who mourns his late wife but does not regret his treatment of her. Uh, though remorse of consciousness can have a repressive, paralyzing effect, as in Stephen's case, it is also vocally positive. A self-conscious awareness of the past, even the sins of the past, help constitute an individual as an ethical being in the present. Of course. So we have uh, the third theme that we have here, compassion as heroic. So in nearly senses, the notion of Leopold Bloom as an epic hero is laughable. His job, talents, family relations, public relations, and private actions at all suggested as, uh, as utter ordinariness. Unlike Odysseus, he is highly respected, he, has a, he is powerful, he is strong, he is very manly. Unlike Leopold, if you have seen in, or if you have, if you are listening in the summary, he, the way he pick his nose, he urinate, he masturbates in front of Kirti. It's very laughable and it's very um, opposite, it's opposite to um, Odysseus in the Odyssey of Homer. Okay, so for the continuation, it, it, it is Bloom's 
Um, it is only Bloom's extraordinary capacity for sympathy and compassion that allows him an ironic heroism in the course of the novel. So Bloom's fluid ability to empathize with a such wide variety of beings, cats, dogs, bird, fish, um, dead men, vicious men, blind men, old ladies, a woman in labor, the poor, if you can still remember Mrs. Purify, Bloy, uh, I'm sorry, Bloom went to, um, mater uh, to the maternity or to the hospital just to visit Miss, uh, Mrs. Purifoy. So that is the compassion of, hero of heroic in this or in the novel Ulysses. There is a network of symbols in Ulysses that represent Bloom as Ireland's savior. Savior, sorry. And his message is, at a basic level, to love. Okay, so well, the last thing that we have is the parallax or the need for multiple perspectives. So parallax is an astronomical term that Blue encounters in his reading and that arises repeatedly through the course of the novel. So it refers or it refers to the difference of position of one object when, uh, when seen from two different vantage points. So these differing viewpoints can be co collated to better approximate the position of the object. As a novel, uh, Ulysses uses a similar tactic. Three main characters, Stephen, Bloom, and Molly, and a subset of narrative techniques that affect our perception of events and char characters to demonstrate the fillability of one single perspective. Our understanding of particular characters and events must be continually revised as we consider further perspectives. So the most obvious example is Molly's past love life. Though we can construct a judgment of Molly as a loose woman from testimonies of various characters in the novel or in the novel, Bloom, Lenny Han, and Daction, and so on, this judgment must be revised with the integration of Molly's own testament. So that is the need for multi perspective. Uh, so we are now down to the motive. So the first motive that we have here is the home you served. So what do we mean when we say or when uh, we say you serve? So when we say you serve, it is taking a position of power or importance illegally or by force. So while Odysseus is away from Ithaca in the Odyssey, his household is usurped by would-be suitors of his wife Penelope. So this motif translates directly to Ulysses and provides a connection between Stephen and Bloom. Stephen pays the rent for the Martello Tower where he, Buck, and Haynes are staying. Buck's demand of the house key is thus a usurpation of Stephen's household right. The Stephen uh, and Stephen recognizes this and refuses to return to the tower. Meanwhile, Bloom's home has been usurped also by Blaze's Boylan, or by Blaze Boylan, who comes and goes at will and has sex with Molly and Bloom's absent or absence. I'm sorry. So Stephen's and Bloom's lack of house key throughout Ulysses symbolizes these usurpations. We are now down to the symbols. So the first symbol that we have here is plum trees potted meat. So in episode 5, he reads an odd in his newspaper. He reads, What is home without plum trees potted meat? Incomplete. With it, an abode of bliss. Bloom's conscious reaction in his belief that the odd is poorly placed directly below the obituaries, suggesting an infel infelit I'm sorry, infelicitous, infelicitous relation between dead bodies and potted meat. On the subconscious level, however, the figure of plum tree spotted meat comes to stand for Bloom's anxieties about Boylan's usurpation of his wife and home. The image of meat inside the pot crudely suggests that sexual relation between Boylan and Molly. The wording of and uh, the wording of the odd uh, further suggests less concretely Bloom's masculine anxieties. He worries that he is not the head of an abode of bliss, 
but rather a servant in a home incomplete. The connection between plum trees meat and Bloom's anxiety about Molly's unhappiness and infidelity is driven home when Bloom's finds crumbs uh, of the potted meat that Boylan and Molly shared earlier in his own bed. Mm. Okay, so the second symbol that we have here is Stefan's Latin Quarter hat. Stefan deliberately conceives of his Latin Quarter hat as a symbol. The Latin Quarter hat is a student district in Paris, and Stefan hopes to suggest his exile anti-establishment status while back in Ireland. He also refers to that hat as his Hamlet hat, tipping off or tipping us off to the intentional brooding and artistic connotations of the headgear. Yet, Stefan cannot always control his own hat as a symbol, especially in the eyes of others. Though, or through the eyes of others, it comes to signify Stefan's, Stefan's mock priestliness and provinciality. So, the last symbol that we have here is Bloom's potato talisman. So in episode 15, Bloom's potato function like Odysseus' use of Molly in Circe's, uh, in Circe's uh, serves to protect him from enchantment. Enchantments to which Bloom succumbs when he briefly gives it over to Zoe Hitchens. The potato old, the, po uh, the potato old and sh uh, shriveled now is a heirloom from Bloom's mother Ellen as an organic product that is both a fruit and root but is shriveled it gestures towards anxieties about fertility and his family line so most important however is the potatoes connections uh, potatoes connection to ireland blooms potato talisman stand for his frequently overlooked maternal irish heritage so thank you so much for listening and i hope you have learned something from my lesson see you again next year and this is jella again good night everybody bye bye